Today I'm going to make the beautiful dye azoviolet, which is named for the brilliant violet color it forms in alkaline solution. Along with another azo dye called para red, this is the final part in a long project I've been working on that began with the conversion of pava to aniline. Here are the other videos that were part of this whole process if you want to check them out, but before I can make para red and finally complete this project once and for all, I still needed to make two naphthol which is not the easiest thing in the world. In any case, to get started on making azoviolet, the first thing I needed to do was to dissolve 1.66 grams of paranitroaniline in 20 milliliters of 2 molar hydrochloric acid. This synthesis procedure is a slight modification of a procedure from experimental chemistry, who, as far as I know, is the first one to demonstrate this procedure on YouTube. He's got a lot of other cool videos like this one, which I'd highly recommend giving a watch if you're interested. Anyway, after a bit of heating and stirring, the paranitroaniline was completely dissolved, and then I added around 45 grams of ice, which reprecipitated the paranitroaniline as a fine suspension. Most of the ice melted here, but there should be at least a little left to assure that the reaction mixture is sufficiently cold. This beaker was next transferred to an ice bath, and to it I added 1 gram of potassium nitrite dissolved in about 3 milliliters of water under constant stirring. This is allowed to continue reacting for about 15 minutes, and during that time, the solution might lighten up a little bit as the reaction proceeds. What's happening here is called the Sandmeyer reaction, and in the first step, potassium nitrite reacts with hydrochloric acid forming nitrous acid and potassium chloride. This nitrous acid then reacts with another molecule of hydrochloric acid, forming water and the nitrosonium ion, which is an extremely strong electrophile. The nitrosonium ion then attacks the amine group, which undergoes several rearrangement steps to eventually produce another molecule of water, along with the diazonium salt, which is in this case called paranitrobenzodiazonium chloride. Um, hope I said that right. And this is our intermediate product. Once this mixture has had about 15 minutes to sit and react, I went ahead and next added around a quarter gram of urea to destroy any excess nitrite. This is allowed to react for another 5 minutes before slowly adding 1.32 grams of resorcinol dissolved in 15 milliliters of 2 molar sodium hydroxide. The moment the resorcinol comes in contact with the diazonium salt, the two will immediately react forming a dense red precipitate of our product, azoviolet. The precipitate here is so dense that magnetic stirring quickly became completely useless, and to fix this, I slowly added as much distilled water as I could without overfilling the beaker. This helped to get things moving again, and at this point, I simply allowed the mixture to continue reacting at room temperature under constant stirring for a little over an hour. Now, while this is doing its thing, I'll try to quickly explain that second reaction, which is a textbook example of an azo coupling. This is a basic EAS reaction wherein the diazonium salt is the electron deficient electrophile and resorcinol is an electron rich nucleophile. The hydroxyl groups of resorcinol are strong ortho and para directors, but since ortho substitution at this position would be far too sterically hindered to stabilize, the diazonium salt exclusively binds to the ortho position here. And yeah, that's pretty much the whole reaction. And these specific types of reactions are honestly really simple. The only thing you really need to be aware of throughout this whole process is that the diazonium intermediate is extremely unstable, and as such needs to be kept ice cold up to the point that it's reacted with the nucleophilic substrate in order to prevent it from decomposing. Anyway, after the mixture had spent about an hour reacting, it was next acidified with a few milliliters of 2 molar hydrochloric acid. The mixture was then transferred to my hot plate and heated under constant stirring until it was nearly boiling. The idea here is that azoviolet is only slightly soluble in cold water, but significantly more soluble in hot water. Even at elevated temperatures, it's still not very soluble and I don't have nearly enough water here to even dream of dissolving this all the way. But I can dissolve enough that when it's allowed to cool back down, there will be enough recrystallized product that filtration should be less of a complete nightmare. To that end, once the mixture was nearly boiling, it was taken off the heat and allowed to cool. Once it had cooled down to around room temperature, the slurry was next passed through vacuum filtration, and this turned out to be a very long and annoying process due to the ultrafine particle size of the azo dye. 
As soon as all the water had eventually been pulled off, the product was thoroughly rinsed with more ice cold water, transferred to a drying dish, and then allowed to dry on my desk for several days. This stuff holds on to a ton of water, so drying it this way is going to take a really long time. There are obviously quicker methods if you're impatient, but I had other things to work on, so I kind of just let it sit. After several days had passed, the azo violet had dried completely, and so I crushed it into a powder and weighed it for a final mass of 2.68 grams, representing an 86% yield. This seems good to me, but I honestly haven't done enough of this type of reaction to say for sure. If you instead look at this in the scope of the entire synthesis procedure going back to PABA, my true percent yield now is 32.33%, which again I consider pretty good for a four-part organic synthesis. Anyway, to demonstrate azoviolet, I decided to dissolve a very small amount of the powder in a weakly alkaline solution. This immediately began to dissolve the azo dye, staining the solution a deep violet, which is where the chemical gets its name. As a side note, this stuff is incredibly potent, and even a few milligrams is enough to deeply color a liter of solution. I underestimated its potency in these demos, so the solutions for the most part ended up a good bit darker than I would have liked. Regardless, this azoviolet solution will turn light yellow when acidified with dilute hydrochloric acid. This property makes azoviolet a decent pH indicator, as the transition from violet to yellow happens around pH 11. This is honestly quite alkaline as far as indicators go, and the only other pH indicator I can think of that makes a transition at such alkaline conditions is indigocarmine. Another cool thing about azoviolet is that it can be used to detect the presence of magnesium ions, and will turn an incredibly deep blue upon reaction with magnesium sulfate in a weakly alkaline solution. I also got a bit of noticeable precipitation a few times I tried this, and I'm really still not sure why, or if this is normal but it looks pretty cool anyway. I got a good bit of footage messing around with this stuff, which you can hang around to watch if you're interested. But aside from that, that's about all I've got for today. On that note, I hope you found this interesting, and as always, I want to thank all my incredible patrons for their generous contributions. Your support is vital and very appreciated. To everyone else, if you'd like to see more content like this, consider subscribing on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, or even by becoming a patron yourself. Thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.